don't know if you picked up on what, can you hear me? Can you hear me with this? Yes. don't know if you picked up what he said there. He said, uh, thank you for the royal subjects. Hopefully they weren't too expensive. Um, that fit, does anyone know what that's from? A bit of trivia? Gladiator, yeah. One of my favorite films, they're making a Gladiator 2. Did you know? I'm excited. No one else seems to be. It must be just me. Um, but no, Gladiator is a really good film. Um, it's about um, uh, a gladiator. So he's a Roman soldier, um, and he doesn't do what the Caesar wants, which was that gentleman there um, coming in on the horses, um, and therefore gets sold into slavery and becomes a gladiator. However, the what I wanted to demonstrate from there was a old tradition, because we all know Leslie spoke about it, and we did the reading about Jesus coming in on Palm Sunday. The whole story of Palm Sunday is Jesus coming on a donkey or a colt, uh, and the symbolism behind that and the reason that he did that. Now, just a bit of background. I'm, I told you last time I spoke, I'm a history buff. I love history. I lead, read loads of magazines and stuff. So doing a bit of homework into this was really fun, which is quite sad, really, but I enjoyed it. Uh, the Roman Triumph. I don't know if anyone's heard of the Roman Triumph. But the Roman Triumph was essentially what we've just seen on that video there. So um, a Caesar or a general of their time, if they'd have been... Uh, successful in some kind of military campaign, they would then perform the Roman triumph as a ceremony as they go into whatever city that they'd conquered. So Caesar there, in that video we've just watched, they, if you, if you watched, I would tell you watch Gladiator, it was really good. Um, the Gladiator film, um, they've come back from a campaign where they were conquering Europe and Germania um, at the time. So um, he was coming back as the conquering Caesar. These images here were just um, some um, carvings that we've got in Rome. Uh, so the first one is uh, Marcus Aurelius, which was the king that was usurped, or the Caesar that was usurped in the film that we've just seen there. And then the second is Arch of Titus in Rome. Um, and they depict this Roman triumph. But what I want to do first of all then is just do a couple of readings. Palm Sunday readings. If I could have the next one up, please. There we go. So, Les has gone through this. So, this was in Zechariah 9. So, this is in the Old Testament. This is before Jesus came. Um, this is a prophecy that was said uh, and read out. So, it's rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he humble and riding on a donkey on a colt the foal of a donkey so that's before the events and then if we can go over to this one now does anyone know if you um, looked in your bibles for this passage it's one of the um one of the passages in the gospels that's in each of the gospels so the gospels uh, if you don't know they're the story of jesus of the 30, first 30 years of jesus's life and they're written from different perspective with bit of different texts and written in different ways based on the author and there are similarities throughout them and there are consistencies however this is one of the stories that is in all four gospels because it's so important so um if you look at the gospels does anyone know what the title for this passage is or what it says no if you read it, it says G jesus's triumph so if we were looking at the Roman triumph that we've just read there, this is Jesus' triumph. So this is Jesus performing a similar kind of act as what the Romans would do, but in Jesus' own way. So let's read it together. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village in front of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, which we read a minute ago, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches 
from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowd says, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Thank you very much. So what Jesus is doing here is fulfilling the prophecy that we saw earlier um, in the passage from the Old Testament in Zechariah. And Jesus is triumphantly coming into Jerusalem. So unlike the Roman, um, this, this is the comparison that I really like. So when you looked at the Roman triumph, they always did it after the conquering had been done. So it was only whenever they'd already um, done whatever they needed to do to win that battle or they'd killed whoever they needed to kill, they'd taken over uh, in quite a violent way. They then came in with their entourage and all of their horses, all their chariots. It says here that they had um, togas painting gold. They'd paint their faces red to try and symbolize um, the, the main Roman god, Jupiter. Um, so they did all this grandeur to show off, look how mighty we are, look how powerful we are, we have conquered you. As if they don't already know, they've already been battered, and then they're coming in like, haha, we've just beaten you up. It's a bit, a bit on the nose, but Jesus does the opposite. So Jesus has already conquered death. Jesus has already come down to earth so that um, he could defeat sin, defeat death, so he is the conquering king coming in. And instead of coming and flashing about the place, he's coming in very gentle, on a donkey, unaggressive, very peaceful. And people know it, people can see it. The people that were there understood that this was a prophecy coming true. Just to bring it back, I'm going to do a bit of a recap. Uh, so the last time I spoke, um, we did a little bit about, if you remember, um, about Jesus's lineage and where Jesus comes from um, and I think it's important especially when we're coming into this kind of story where we're talking today about the king arriving and Jesus being the one king it's important to understand where it's come from and how that relates to us because at the time people could see that Jesus was um, fulfilling what was said by the prophets and fulfilling what was said in the Old Testament in the scriptures but what does it mean for us today? So if we could just have a look at the first line. So if you remember, we looked at um, through the line of Solomon was Joseph. So in, the, um, in Matthew, um, it talks about the lineage of Jesus going all the way back to Joseph. Um, and that was therefore the um, names I spoke about last time that um, father's names were passed on and through that, was the inheritance and the legal right to um, whatever possessions the father had. So from David, we have a legal route all the way down to Jesus through the line of Solomon. On the other side then, please, Mike, through David's son Nathan, in Luke, they follow the uh, lineage of David all the way down through to Mary to Jesus, which is then the bloodline. So we have Jesus being king through a legal right through the line of Solomon and we have Nathan, uh, Nathan's line coming through to Mary to Jesus, the bloodline. So Jesus was the legal heir to the throne of Jerusalem and of Israel and he was the, through the bloodline, the blood heir. So he was naturally should be king anyway. And then on top of that, God that Jesus is for everyone on the earth. It was a promise to the whole world that anyone who believes in him can be adopted as a child of God, which makes us heirs with God. We can be um, a part of that kingdom. We can be a part of all of the power and might that Jesus brings. We can be a part of that and see that within our lives. And Jesus is sacrificed for us is not just for the people of Israel, it's for the entire world. The fantastic thing about the story um, of Jesus coming in, we see that he's peaceful in the way that he comes in, but the act of what he actually did for us is amazing. So Jesus came 
peaceful, non-aggressive, knowing that within that week that he would be tried, he would be killed for everyone else's sins. He was innocent. Jesus is innocent. Jesus is the only person ever to live on this earth that is innocent. We can try our best to live our lives like Jesus. We can try our best to work to follow his teachings and follow the way that he wants us to live. However, he's the only one that was perfect. But despite all that, he took on the burden of our shame, our sin. All of us have done things that we're not proud of, but Jesus took all of those things and he died for us so that we could live with him forever. It's an amazing story. It's an amazing thing. The best thing that I like about this story as well is when we talk about, I, I, I seem a little bit um, separated from the idea of a king and having a king because we do have a king, but it's very different to what it was like back in the olden days where um, you had King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table and you'd be knighted. And whenever you watch these kind of films, there's a lot of, I don't know, passion for the king, isn't there? And I'm not saying there are people that are passionate for the royal family, and that's fantastic. Um, but we have, we have a king called Jesus that we should be passionate for. We should be blown away by the grace and mercy of God and of our king Jesus. And it's an amazing thing that we have that king. And the thing that really um, strikes me, and I spoke similar about this last time, is... It's quite easy when you're looking at uh, stories in the Bible, when you're reading your Bible, to be a little bit separated from it, especially when you're looking at the Old Testament um, and even the sacrifice of Jesus. It's been a long time since that happened. So there is a bit of a historical gap now from when it happened. But if you understand the fact I'm doing an assignment at the minute for, which is due in tomorrow, uh, hopefully none of my people that are going to be marking it or watching it is due in tomorrow, but I'm well ahead. I'm, I'm really organized. I've got an assignment due in tomorrow, uh, which is all about the doctrine of the Trinity. So it's, it's a beast to write, but I'm getting there. Um, but the really interesting thing that I pulled out of it, um, there's a bit on pneumatology, which is the study of the Holy Spirit. It's just a fancy word for saying, um, understanding what the Holy Spirit is and how the Holy Spirit fits into the Trinity. Um, and I've been writing a bit about that historical gap that we have at the minute from when the events of the Bible happened to the now, and there can be a bit of separation from it where you can't see yourself in the story. That's where the Holy Spirit comes in. The Holy Spirit is now with us. We can accept the Holy Spirit into our lives. If we, expect ex if we accept Jesus into our lives and accept God into our lives, we also accept the Holy Spirit into our lives, and the Holy Spirit is that living connection that we have in us now that will allow us to break any historical gap that there is and be in the story now and let Jesus be in your story now. The bit that I really love is when you get to that point and you understand that Jesus is alive, Jesus has died for our sins, get rid of the hour and put my in there. He's died for me. He is my king. He is your, your king. Break it down on the personal level. It, I found that when I've started doing that, it does break away the distance that I've had over the years with God and not looking at it as a um, story that we need to understand. Palm Sunday, the Easter story, Christmas stories, they're great stories, but there's big power behind them all. Jesus Everything is centered around Jesus. Jesus, his love for us, his grace, his undying love for all of humanity, but for you as well as individuals. It's just fantastic. Do I have another slide? There we are, yeah. So, <laughs> couldn't remember what it was. So, the, the whole point of um, the Pam Sunday story is to understand that Jesus is our king. J uh, Jerusalem knew it, the people there that were shouting Hosanna, pulling down their coats. It was an act of uh, respect and understanding, knowing that Jesus was the king. We need to accept Jesus as king into our lives today. And we need to remember with um, the story of Palm Sunday, 
we should have that kind of excitement every day when we come to Jesus. We should have that wanting to serve. We should want to put our coats down and live our lives according to the way that Jesus wants us to live. We should want to bow down to a heavenly king who rules over all, who conquers death. And we say these kind of things in church. We say it, it comes sometimes it, you just get used to saying it. But he conquered death. That's an amazing thing. So death is broken. Death is no longer there if we believe in Jesus. It's fantastic. It's such an amazing thing to have a king. Whatever earthly king we might worship, whatever earthly king that might come along, they could never do what Jesus has done for us. And as I said at the beginning, the thing that annoys Leslie about Jesus Christ Superstar, the story doesn't end at his death. So he died for us. Fantastic. That's really amazing. And it's really great that Jesus took on the burden of all of the things that we've ever done wrong and sacrificed himself on our behalf. But the amazing thing is, and the reason that it's called Holy Week, the reason that we're excited and looking forward to next week is that Jesus rose again. He didn't stay dead. He came back to life. And we can share that with him. So it's not a case of he came back to life, wiped the slate clean. And it means that we therefore have just all of a sudden been given this get out of jail free card. It's an, we get to share in that glory with God. So this is where it comes back to the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the power that brought Jesus back to life. Is the power that gave life to all of creation. Is the power that brought Jesus back to life this time next week. Even though it was ages ago. But you know what I mean. <laughs> when we celebrated this time next week. But that same Holy Spirit lives in us. And through us loving Jesus, accepting the sacrifice that he's done for us, we can let that Holy Spirit into our lives and we can share in that resurrection. So it's not just a case of Jesus runs to the dead. We will share in that resurrection. When we die, we will share in that resurrection and we will live with Jesus forever. Isn't that good? Yeah, I think it's fantastic. I think it's an amazing thing that sometimes we can take for granted. I'm not saying that you guys take it for granted. I'm talking from my own perspective. I do take things for granted, and I can sometimes find myself separated from the words in the Bible. Remember that whenever you read the Bible, when you read the Bible Jesus is alive today. He loves you, and everything that's in this Bible is to help guide us to understand him better, understand how we can be better Christians, understand how we can be better people. It's not necessarily better Christians, better people. Take the religion out of it. Religion is great, and people could say, um, do you have a religion often? I will say, no, I'm not religious. I follow Jesus. And that's the thing that we need to get into the habit of doing is not focusing on all the jargon and all the things that sometimes overcomplicate it. Break it down to the core of it all jesus gave his life for us and that for everyone who believes in him we can share in his eternal life it's a fantastic hope we've all got it it's a faith that we can have in jesus and i just pray that if you don't know jesus today that you talk to someone if you want to talk to someone or if you want to know more there's plenty of people here that would love to talk to you let me pray Lord Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice. And thank you that you rose from the dead. Without you, Lord, there is, there is no life. We need you in our lives. And I just thank you that you're living now and that we can draw from you and we can be empowered by you. We can get comfort from you. You help us in most situations, Lord. And I just pray that if there's anyone here today that don't know you, Lord, that they open their hearts to you. Your love is amazing and we're so lucky to have you in our lives. We lift you up, Lord. We glorify your name. We've been singing this morning about um, thank you for being our king and we lift up a shout. We praise your name. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit for being in our lives and guiding us. We lift you up this morning, Lord. Amen.